Hello and welcome to a review of a dollhouse burn we conducted here at training uh, that's meant to show you a lot of the principles of uh, ventilation that we've been discussing. So uh, quick, we'll, we'll take a quick brief tour of the dollhouse. Uh, you can see the room where we intend to burn in and you'll note that the other rooms are essentially absent of any other combustible materials beyond the the construction itself, which uh, is three quarter inch OSB. You'll note that there are openings throughout the building, uh, one opening in between each room and a single opening from the first floor to the second floor. And that'll allow heat and smoke to commute around the building. So we initially go ahead and light our fire in the small crib that we set in the lower left hand corner. And you can see as the fire starts, this fire is completely fuel driven. Uh, that is, the fire has plenty of oxygen available in the structure for it to grow, uh, and it will continue to increase in size and intensity uh, for as long a period as it has sufficient oxygen. And this is pretty much what defines the incipient stage. As the fire builds and it gets larger, you, get, you begin to see in its growth stage that it's developing a very clear air track and flow paths in the building. In this case, with two single ventilation openings, you have an inlet at the bottom where there is almost no neutral plane visible or the neutral plane is at the very top of the window. So it is almost an entire inlet uh, for oxygen into the fire and because there is a second story and it's open there is no neutral plane it is at the base of the window and it is a complete outlet for smoke flowing out. The smoke that is flowing out demonstrates uh, a laminar flow that is a smooth easy flow. Uh, there is not a great amount of heat energy visible at this point although there is some loft or speed to the smoke as it comes out. Here's another look at the smoke, and this is what we're looking with the laminar flow. All of the smoke is moving in a uniform direction, and at the base you catch a quick, quick glimpse of air being drawn in. So now we can see the compartment that we have under ignition. We've got some black smoke coming up. It's just prior to it flashing over. We'll see it move to flash over. <clears throat> and as the room is at flash over, we have a fully developed fire. This fire is representing about 25% of the total structure, but we've already moved to a fire that is now ventilation controlled. In order for all the fuel source that's available to it to burn, it has to burn outside of the structure at this point. So we have flames exhausting from it. And where before we had a total inlet on the first floor, you now see a clearly defined neutral plane with fire exhausting in the top and air and smoke rushing back in in the bottom half of the opening. So we're going to take our fire and uh, we're going to air starve it by closing off its inlets. And the first thing that you'll notice is now with the primary inlet removed, we have smoke exhausting from the fire compartment. You see very turbulent flow, and you can also see some evidence of smoke tunneling because air is being forced to be drawn back in through the second floor inlet because that is the only opening now available to it. So you see a bi-directional air track where it should be unidirectional because we're above the fire, but this is the only source uh, for oxygen for the fire. So it's the smoke is tunneling back in trying to draw oxygen down and if we could see the fire compartment room we would see that the visible fire would be diminishing rapidly although combustion is still going on there's not enough oxygen for visible fire at this point we're going to open up a different window and when you open that different window you're going to change the flow path within the building so same fire room, now it has a different ventilation point and we get to see the smoke exhaust again. You see a bi-directional air track, you see air being drawn in at the base 
and smoke at the top of the window because that's the only opening that it has. <clears throat> As we give it an opening for air at the bottom, this second story window goes back to being a unidirectional, uh, air, having a unidirectional air track and smoke begins to occupy the entire window space. And as the fire below it gets more oxygen, you can see the velocity of the smoke increase in the window as more energy is being gained in the fire compartment, more energy is being pushed out the top of the building. When the fire is starved for oxygen, you'll see the alterations in smoke color going from very little visible smoke to as it receives some air it'll go to white smoke and then the smoke gets darker and as the fire revs up inside that compartment you'll see a more and more turbulent flow from the window also of note on the first floor you'll see small puffs of combustion <clears throat> as the smoke byproducts coming off the fire come out mixed with air and get into their flammable range we have a good opportunity to demonstrate this now. We're allowing a lower inlet. You have a second floor outlet. We go ahead and give it an ignition source. There's nothing burning on the second floor. The only fire is on the first floor. All that you have is superheated gases and products of combustion coming out of the window. And they're in their ignitable range. And you'll see that ignitable range only exists outside the structure. Inside the structure, there is nothing burning at all. A person inside that room, if they were well enough protected, would see no visible fire. On the outside, lots of visible fire, and you can very well, very clearly see the interface line where that uh, mixing is occurring and the, and the burn can be sustained. And uh, <clears throat> it'll sustain itself pretty much indefinitely without any interaction since we're not putting any water on the fire at this point. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close off our second floor exhaust port. We're gonna starve our fire for oxygen here for a moment. Again, you see some white smoke produced right away. <clears throat> Very little smoke initially, not an indication that there's not a fire. In fact, we know there's a fire inside this building, but we weren't seeing a lot of smoke until we gave it a ventilation point uh, for it to, uh, to have ventilation take place. Good shot here. There's no visible fire in the fire room, but you can see the heat energy that's being produced, the turbulent smoke pushed outside of the room. And this fire is within its flammable range, uh, but remains oxygen starved. And uh, just about the point where we come over and decide that we'll relight the room to speed things off, we actually will introduce enough oxygen into the room that you'll see the room reignites on its own. And then we have continued combustion and left alone the fire room will um, will continue uh, to burn. <clears throat> when we cover up the window to the fire room, and we'll see if we can force it to seek an outlet, and it's going to want to move around the corner through the opening that you saw cut in the wall before, and it's going to reach out to the window where we've created an opening. And this is a classic example of a flow path. Although the room on your right is not burning, <clears throat> the uh, superheated gases are coming out of that room. They're in their flammable range and they're moving to their exit point that we've allowed. When we give it another source, it'll choose the path of least resistance. But in this case, we created a flow path remote from the fire itself. So the fire moves through the flow path and in a Structure fire, this would be considered a hostile flow path. Um, there's enough energy in the smoke that's traveling through there for it to readily burn uh, and release a great deal of energy. All right, so as they move around through here, uh, 
look at the windows, you see a good bi-directional first floor window there. <clears throat> you get a great view of the flow path here. We did some vertical ventilation. Look at the changes in smoke in the first floor. Almost no smoke visible on that first floor on the right hand side. And you can clearly see the flow path from the fire room. It travels across the ceiling of the second room and goes directly to our uh, vertical ventilation point. <clears throat> there is nothing to burn beyond the structure itself in that second floor room. What you're just seeing is those gases burning off. And this would be, uh, again, an extremely hostile flow path if we were to create a path like this when you had crews operating on that second floor. Close off our air inlets on the first floor. You see the energy diminish at the vertical vent point. And you have a completely unidirectional flat uh, vent point with your vertical ventilation at this point, there's really no ability for the fire to get any oxygen other than what we give it from any of the openings we make. <clears throat> and as we close it off, you'll see uh, the color of the smoke becomes a much lighter color. And you'll see some uh, uh, movement of the smoke back and forth as the fire gulps for air you'll see smoke push out and be drawn in. Uh, and it's very clear along the base of the building uh, where you can see some forward and backwards movement of the smoke because you have a extremely well-developed fire inside. It's completely oxygen starved and uh, it's ideal backdraft conditions. Now, given the size and uh, scale of our model, there is uh, a little opportunity to get a clear backdraft but all the principles of the backdraft are in place. You have a explosive mixture of fuels that, um, and you have a fire that is outside of its combustible range, although it is, uh, it, we still have a, a tremendous amount of heat. And eventually if we give it that oxygen, it will reignite aggressively. And you saw that across the two rooms as that flash rolled across. If we had that in a confined space or we could have placed glass in there or we didn't have those boards on the windows to hold them in place, you have enough energy with that that it actually forces uh, or expels a lot of gas at the same time, which we would interpret as a, uh, an explosive force. So a lot of heat energy inside this building. You can see that as we give it air at this point. Almost every surface inside the building is off-gassing, so there is a tremendous amount of fuel, but uh, it's the epitome of a ventilation-controlled fire. It can only burn as much as we uh, ventilate it, and it'll remain in the state until it either runs out of uh, oxygen and dies off, it runs out of fuel completely, uh, or we intervene with a hose line and move it back into a fuel-controlled regime. Uh, by lowering the uh, temperatures inside the fire compartments. So, very turbulent flow from the second floor window, but again, we get a nice view of smoke tunneling here. As we limit the available oxygen in the fire compartment, you'll see a gulping action where the smoke billows out and then pulls back in. <clears throat> Ultimately, because we have a lot of fire on our prop, you'll get ignition of the smoke, but you continue to see a turbulent flow, and then the fire eventually will force its way all the way back from the flow path uh, from the second story back all the way to the fire compartment. At this point, a tremendous amount of energy is available, even from this tiny little prop. And that's a product of all, every surface inside of it now off-gassing and providing fuel, not just the crib. In fact, the crib that we built is not even visible anymore and is uh, long gone.
we've got our vertical vent point open uh, just opening up the room and give you a view you can see uh, very clearly how much uh, how much fuel is available to this fire uh, and without us providing water uh, to the seat of the fire <clears throat> and we're giving it additional oxygen. You're just gonna see a lot of rapid fire growth. I'm gonna take a second here. We're gonna get our prop back under control. And uh, when we get the point where we have the prop back in control, we'll go ahead and show you that we can introduce uh, water to the seat of the fire. Uh, and uh, anything that um, takes some energy out of the system can be a beneficial thing. Here, again, you get a quick look at the mechanism for backdraft. We have the, the fuel in the form of gases. We can take the fire out of it, and we can go ahead and get the various compartments to ignite uh, almost instantly just by altering the oxygen supply into the compartments. We go back to introducing some water into the compartment, and it's sort of counterintuitive, but if you watch the flame action as we introduce water, and that's just water that's being sprayed in there, you'll see jets of flame coming out of our prop. And although you cannot move fire around a building with water, what we're showing you here is you can clearly introduce and move fire inside the building by introducing air. And when you use your hose stream, especially a broken stream or a fog type pattern, you're going to introduce a tremendous amount of air into the structure. And you can see, consequently, we can actually make the fire bigger at the same time that we're applying water into it. We're kind of approaching the end time of our prop at this point. It's uh, seen quite a good burn at this uh, point a number of the interior partitions have begun to fail and uh, you'll see the floor collapse and the fire uh, is going to go and return itself to a uh, fuel driven regime as we will allow it unlimited oxygen it'll the roof will fail there will no longer be any way for us to control uh, how much oxygen is allowed to it. The fire is back essentially to a, to a bonfire. And we went from fuel driven when you saw it at the beginning to incipient to completely uh, ventilation driven. And when you watched us manipulate over and over again uh, how ventilation could control fire inside the building. And now finally you're back to a fuel driven regime where the only thing we can do is take the fuel away go ahead and introduce a little bit of water and ultimately uh, put our prop out. So the whole point was let you see a lot of these principles firsthand. It's a real simple, basic prop, um, but it allows you to easily define uh, the various parameters that we want you to show versus, uh, versus looking at a full-size structure that may have a lot more dynamics involved. So again, hopefully by seeing this stuff in the form of a prop, uh, you'll be able to recognize these in the future on the fire ground and put it to good use uh, for your own protection and for the benefit of, uh, of your fellow firefighters and your crew.